you've come to Lily's Viking Adventures. Uh, today, I will be reading an article by Daniel Svaborg and Karen Beck Peterson from academia.edu. I was given permission to read this article. Daniel Svaborg is a professor of the University of Tartu, University of Southern Denmark. The title is Folklore in Old Norse, Old Norse in Folklore Introduction. Please give me a like, share my channel to people you think might be interested. Make a comment if you enjoyed this. All positivity is welcome. And I will get started. For a long time, supernatural elements in the Old Norse saga literature from 13th and 14th centuries were highly neglected among scholars. The sagas were famous for their realism. And most scholars tended to focus on aspects and elements that would fit this view, which included valuable studies on feuds and the social and societal structure of the sagas but left little room for encounters with other world beings. Works and genres that incorporate more than sporadic supernatural and fantastic motifs were seen as peripheral anomalies and were tucked away in the background. Such elements were usually explained as late features and were in fact seen as signs of the de degeneration of Old Norse literature. See, for example, Sigurdr Nordal, 1953, 261. At least part of the explanation for this focus can probably be found in the contemporary trends and personal views and convictions of the scholars behind such studies. During the last few decades, however, this has changed. The Fornold Sogur with their focus on encounters with giants, trolls, and other monsters, are the subject of recent studies collected in the three volumes in the series edited by Ney et al., 2003, 2009, and 2012. And the other world motifs were likewise discussed in many of the contributions of McKinnell et al., 2006. Several articles and monographs on giants, Schultz, 2004, Trolls, Dwarves, Armin Jacobson, 2008-2005, and other similar beings have been written in recent years, and this clearly bears witness to the new interest in these aspects of the Old Norse literature. Moreover, it also reveals what can be gained from a more nuanced approach to the study of saga literature. Despite the many overlaps and dividing lines between the genres into which the sagas have traditionally been grouped in the academic context, it is only fair to say that sagas, broadly speaking, present a worldview that pays attention to much more than realism, hard facts, and objective truths. Supernatural, fantastic, symbolic, and metaphorical aspects are present with what one might justifiably call folkloric tenacity. There is no doubt that studies such as those mentioned above have deepened our understanding of especially the Fornaldsogur, the Icelandingasogur, however, have not been examined as fully and have not been equally successfully explained regarding the supernatural motifs that also these contexts that also these texts contain one of the main reasons for this is their realistic character and their setting in an icelandic society which has in the eyes of many a scholar seemed difficult to reconcile with encounters with other world beings. Scholars tend to divide the Icelandingasogur into two groups, one classical, consisting of sagas based on oral tradition, perceived as fundamentally historical and focusing on socially oriented 
conflicts between Icelanders, and one post-classical, consisting of sagas that are regarded as fictitious works written by creative authors focusing on fantastic events and influenced by the Fornald Sogr. Vestin Olesen, 2007, is a typical representative of this view. The basis of this view is that supernatural elements and Icelandingasogr are seen as exceptions and as signs of fiction. Other scholars, however, have noted that supernatural beings could just as well have been regarded as reality by medieval Icelanders, and these scholars have questioned the exceptional character of this type of episodes. Armin Jacobson, 1998, represents this view. Armin and Vestin nonetheless share a literary comparative method wherein other world motifs in Iceland Dingo Sogr are analyzed in the light of other sagas. Both Fornal Darsogr and Iceland Sogr. This has resulted in a significantly increased knowledge of the sagas as literary works, but it has not solved the problem of how other world stories were conceived. During the 20th century, Old Norse phil phil philology has been strongly textually oriented. This is especially evident in saga scholarship where the book prose ideology of the Icelandic school turned the question of the origins of individual sagas into an issue of direct influences from other written works. This focus had certain methodological advantages in terms of reducing the scope for unwarranted assumptions and speculative reconstruction, but it has also meant that f folklorists' knowledge and methods have been neglected Scholars have generally failed to take account of the extensive material of later works and records of folk belief and folklore. An important purpose of the present volume is to emphasize the relevance of these sources and methods for Old Norse studies, to disclose what sorts of results may be achieved this way, but also to maintain an awareness of what the limitations are, and through discussion, try to solve the problems inherent to this approach. The traditional type of comparative method in Old Norse thus concerns comparisons of text to other texts, and the texts discussed are Old Norse texts that are compared to each other in order to establish relationships. One of the texts is supposed to throw light on the other and make an interpretation possible, as well as function as the starting point for the analysis. This is the basis of the so-called written skill method, which is employed in all the saga introductions to the standard Islandic Fornrit editions of saga text. And this has been the standard method in saga research in general. This method has, as mentioned, been successful and has made it possible to establish certain relationships and fixed points for interpretation and understanding, not least with regards to some patterns in the descriptions of the other world. For example, Armin Jacobson, 2008, 2009, Schultz, 2004. But it also leaves numerous aspects unexplained. In many cases, motifs and concepts cannot be explained by merely pointing to influences from other preserved texts, but they can in several cases be greatly clarified by being considered in the light of recordings from much later periods instead. One example of this is Ingjaldr, episode in Bardr, saga Snelfa Sass which lacks Old Norse parallels, but has close parallels in Norwegian folk legends recorded in the 20th century, edited in Strompdal, 1939, p. 
page 49. In some cases, specific textual parallels from the other sagas have been suggested by scholars, while much closer parallels are found in lady, later records. In the Old Norse texts, which have previously been seen as having influenced one another directly, should rather be regarded as oral variants of the same story, also recorded at a later stage. One example is John Grimmer, Encounter in Strolunga Saga, which Jonna Louis Jensen claimed was influenced by the description of the encounter between the blacksmith and Odin in Boglunga Sugur. Louise Jensen, 2009. Although much closer parallels are found in folk legends from Bahusalan and the Varmla Landnas, recorded in the 20th century, edited by Bergstrand, 1947, and Bergstrand, 1962. C.F. Sabborg, 2014, in print. These Swedish legends probably represent a story that was known in medieval Iceland and which constitutes the common root of the Jarngrimur and the Odin episodes in the two separate sagas, generally an oral background to motifs and episodes in the sagas seems likely much more often than is indicated in the saga introductions of Islandic Forrit. In many cases, the folkloric parallels might supplement the investigations founded on more traditional philological methods. Armamin Jacobson, 2008, has listed and examined the different descriptions of trolls in the saga text and tried to establish and analyze the Old Norse conception of the look, peculiarity, and function of trolls. This investigation significantly increases our knowledge, but an inclusion of later Scandinavian material and theoretical concepts from folkloristics not least the distinction between sage and marshen, would most probably solve several of the remaining questions. Folkloristics also supplies us with theoretical models created for the kind of material encountered in a living tradition, which means that it has the potential to provide greater knowledge of how the stories were perceived by contemporary narrators and audiences this gives the theory and the conception of the supernatural a stronger basis in empirics and certainty of knowledge than does the literary theory usually used in examinations of the supernatural motifs in Old Norse literature. Old Norse scholarship has, in short, much to gain from becoming a great deal more familiar with the folkloristic concepts and models. Few scholars have gone about analyzing the basic view of the supernatural in Old Norse literature, and interesting contributions have been produced by E.G. Mundahl, 2006, and Mitchell, 2006, who have used the concepts of supernatural versus fantastic to explain different perceptions of truth, an approach that has been rare in these contexts is, however, the folkloristic approach. There are scattered references to Max Luthi in Andalhudur and Gudsmundotur, 2006, and Mitchell, 2006, mainly to describe the distinction between Fornald Sogur and Iceland Sogur. But folkloristic concepts have hardly been used in the analysis of Icelandinga Sogur, an interesting attempt made by John Lindau, 1986, to use Lori Honko's description of the Otherworld encounter in the Ingrian Memorats was never followed up. Daniel Saab Borg, 2009, made an analysis of the Otherworld encounters in the Icelandinga Sogur using Max Luthi's analysis of one-dimensionality versus two-dimensionality. Sabah Borg, 2009, 
in 2014 argues for the use of late recorded folk legends as comparative material in the study of Iceland Icelandinga saga in addition to the contemporary saga literature. These approaches are to a large extent followed up in this volume. In the present volume, eight articles are collected, all of which develop further the bringing together of Old Norse philology and folklore studies, and they discuss and test methods in order to shed new light on the supernatural in the Old Norse literature. The articles all treat the issue of literary, learned, written tradition on the one hand versus oral folk tradition on the other hand. All of them also deal completely or partially with supernatural motifs and beliefs in Old Norse. The ways in which these eight articles approach the combine and combine these issues are nonetheless different. Thomas A. Dubois, Stephen Mitchell, and Karen Beck Peterson examine these matters from a general point of view, albeit through concrete examples. While the remaining five authors focus on specific genres or works, Alde Heider, Gudman's daughter, on the genre of Bornalde Soger, broadly speaking, and Rolf O'Connor, Camilla Osplund, Ingemark, Elder Heid, and Annette Lassen all focus on one individual Iceland. Icelandinga saga, namely Bardar saga, Snilfelsas. In the case of this particular saga, which is a striking example of how easily the saga genre incorporates both, both literary and folkloric elements side by side, Lassen mainly conducts, conducts the traditional literary study of textual comparison but less traditionally emphasizes the supernatural elements, which are frequently neglected in the studies of the genre of Isl Iceland Dinga Sogar, while Asplund Ingelmark, on the other hand, avoid this, avoids this kind of textual comparison and instead analyzes the supernatural motifs and story patterns from the point of folkloristic theory. O'Connor tries to establish the balance between written and oral sources for the saga and its supernatural motifs, while Heidi examines a possible ancient and pre-Christian tradi tradition behind the same motifs. When presented side by side, as they are here, these four articles on ba Bardar Saga illustrate just how greatly our knowledge about one saga can be enhanced by shining light onto it from all different disciplines, folklore, philology, history of literature, and of religion. Notable are the attempts from two of the authors to use folkloristic theory to throw light onto the supernatural within Old Norse sagas. This is the main object of Athal Hedir Gudmundsdotter, analysis of Fornalda Sogar as a genre, and is also the object of Camilla Asplund Ingelmark's article on the allegedly post classical Bardar saga, Snilfelsas. Both these authors are pioneers in using this theoretical approach on a genre and on a saga, respectively, traditionally seen as fundamentally literary. But discussed in these articles also are terms of their oral character. The long-term perspective in itself, which is a condition for connecting medieval Norse texts with later folklore records, is discussed in the volume by three of these authors. Stephen Mitchell focuses on the degree of continuity of beliefs in Scandinavia, and examines the sources where such continuity seems to be present. Karen Beck Peterson and Elder Heidi both discuss the possibilities for reconstruction. Heidi focuses mainly on the potential reconstruction of pre-Christian beliefs about guardian spirits, 
local deities, and supernatural beings by combining high-level medieval saga texts with late recorded folklore and later learned information. Beck Peterson raises a number of fundamental theoretical questions about reconstruction of lost stories, traditions, and beliefs on the basis of combining Old Norse texts and fragments with later sources. By presenting these eight articles together here, we hope to make clear that there are still many avenues to explore, that well-known approaches and methodologies from other disciplines can be useful and valuable to the study of saga texts. And indeed, that much can be revealed by research that is open to this blending together of traditionally separate disciplines. It is obvious that the various academic fields each employ useful and valuable methods and strategies. We hope herewith to show that not one field is more useful or more valuable than any other, but indeed that the way forward towards a more nuanced, more comprehensive and better understanding of the sagas lies in the combined forces of different disciplines. That's all for this article today. I will continue to read some of the other articles presented by the authors mentioned. Please give me a like, subscribe, make a comment. It really helps for other people to see my channel. Um, I realize this one is a bit drier, but there are people who use my channel for sleeping and, and also for learning a little bit more in depth into these Norse sagas and stories. And I really want to include uh, the ideas and the thoughts of some of these professionals who are actively researching and writing about these things. So uh, I hope you enjoyed and I will continue this series with more articles from these professional Norse studies people and hopefully shed some light on some of these sagas and their uh, interesting spiritual aspects. Thank you and I hope you have a good night.